Hello, everyone. Welcome to MLOps London. Um, you know, it's a pleasure to host you again today. Uh, sad a little bit that you know we're just online only today. Um, sort of undenied about that. It was you know I really wanted to have an in-person element if possible, but um, you know with the restrictions going back and forth and the caseload being so high, it just seemed like it, the timing didn't quite work. I think maybe if we'd been in you know a few weeks' time, a lot more people would be back in the office and we'd have been able to run you know hybrid like we normally do. But uh, you know nevertheless, here we are. Um, we've still got two fantastic great speakers. Um, and you know, plenty of opportunity to, you know, share knowledge with each other and, and ask good questions. So um, before I kick off and introduce the speakers, just a couple of things to cover. Um, the first thing is, like, given this is online, let's make it as interactive as possible. So please ask questions. You know, put them in the chat. I'll I'll be monitoring that and I'll be able to ask them as as the speakers go along. Um, and then, you know, another thing that would be good would be, you know, if you could throw in the chat. Um, like where you're joining from as well. I know that we don't necessarily just have people from London, but actually we've had people from all over the world like join and watch these meetups in the past. So it'd be really cool to know where you're from and you know maybe a little bit about what you do as well. Really interesting. Um, today's event wouldn't happen without the you know the help of our sponsor Selden, um, who you know coincidentally I work for, but. Um, very importantly, like give me the time to work on this meetup, to find good speakers, to organize everything. Um, and when we do the in-person things, you know, they pay for the drinks and food and stuff like that. Um, Selden are a machine learning ops company who do model serving, management, explainability, and monitoring. Uh, so if you want to find out more about that, you know, find me or, or go to the Selden website. And very importantly, we're actually hiring. So like we're, you know, after people with ML engineering type skills. Uh, there are a ton of roles, you know, from product, tech, marketing, et cetera. Um, so again, you know, hit me up if you're interested in any of that. Um, final thing to say before we start is, uh, you know, if you're interested in speaking as well, um, you know, let me know, right? I'm always looking for interesting stories, uh, like you're going to hear from Jan and Matt today. Um, you know, it's just interesting to hear people's experiences. So um, wherever you work, whatever you do, uh, there's always something interesting about what you do. Um, and it would be great to share it with the rest of the community. Um, without further ado, I'm going to bring the I'll bring the speakers up, and we'll say hi. And so, hey, Jan, and let me add that as well. Hello. Cool. Hey. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm joined by Jan, who's a, a principal data scientist at Trainline, and also by Matt, who is a co-founder at Fuzzy Labs. Um, what we'll do is we're going to have Jan speak first. Um, and then we'll have like a very quick break, uh, you know, because it's online, no one has to go very far to go to the loo. So uh, we'll just give you a couple of minutes, Max, you know, go and grab a cup of tea or something. Uh, and then we'll do Matt's talk. Um, and then afterwards, just any questions and things that people might have. Um, so, yeah, I think what we'll do is I will pass over to Jan and we will get started. Great. Brilliant. Let me just bring your slides up. Fantastic. Cool. Right. Over to you. I'll, I'll drop in when we have questions in the chat. Yeah, thank you. And I can see we have an international audience, um, Portugal and New York. So I probably have to do some introductions to train line. Um, but yeah, so I, I was thinking about what I should talk about. And I settled in the end on um, that very clickbaity title of delivering the last mile of data science. Um, basically how to get the right models into the right places. And I know that that's the very end of um, a long um, development pipeline, which all has its own um, MLOps um, challenges. But I feel like that there is a lot of content um, on the earlier stages um, of model development, et cetera, out there. and. So I, I hope I, I make it interesting by focusing on that last bit even so, yes, you need to get there first. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And um, um, I hope that all of this will make sense. So um, one slide of um, shameless self-promotion. Um, I am a data scientist by profession, but 
Um, I ended up in data science um, because of my passion for tech. Um, and I still see myself as a techie geek and innovator um, at heart. At the moment, I'm the um, principal data scientist um, at Trainline, and I lead the data products team at Trainline as a team lead. And I will talk a little bit about what I'm doing there um, in a moment. Um, my background, I have a PhD in maths, which makes me a smart cookie if I would remember any of it. <laughs> um, after my PhD, I um, set out to um, co-found a startup with some friends, um, Enerchange, and um, Enerchange is now the biggest utility switching provider in Japan. Um, they have seen an IPO last year, so that was very successful. Um, I, I led data science teams before at um, um, big um, UK PLCs like the Rank Group and Supla, and I was a um, data titan in 2020, which feels like yesterday, but actually I realized it's two years ago. Um, I do blog a lot um, on Medium about like my experience and the kind of um, um, models I build. And feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and send me any questions you might have after the um, talk. So for the international audience, um, Trainline is is a platform um, to buy train tickets. <laughs> um, and our purpose is to empower people to make greener travel choices. The um, train is a much um, greener and better choice over um, car and, um, and flights. Um, and we have the vision to build the world's number one um, rail platform to, to achieve that. And you might ask, well, how far did we get to be being the world's number one rail platform? Well, I mean, it's a vision, so there's still some way to go, but we, we did some really good progress. I would say there are um, 270 different rail and coach carriers which are integrated into the train line platform, and we're serving customers in um, over 45 countries. And you can book train and coach journeys between um, 27,000 stations um, on the train line platform. So that's it's a quite a big beefy platform there. And it attracts around 96 million visits um, to our apps and websites every month. And we have over 30 million app downloads. So a very mobile app first um, kind of customer audience. Um, and the one thing I learned after joining Trainline is that Trainline is much bigger um, than I thought when I joined. Um, this number of stations, countries, um, customers, and um, app downloads create a much bigger volume of um, opportunity and data and data challenges than than I expected um, at the beginning, and is. Is exactly why it's an exciting place to work as a data scientist solving um, problems with data. Um, I'm the lead of the data products team where we focus on real time data applications. And just to show you what that means and looks like, I thought I'll show you one example of a um, data product we have built in my team. Um, it's called Crowd Alerts. Um, and that's how it looks like in, in the app. Um, it is basically um, an end-to-end -end application which collects crowdsourced data about um, where um, um, customers can report how busy a train is um, when they take rail journeys. And we um, ingest that data. We, um, we engineer that data and join it up with um, industry data and timetable data from other sources and um, apply machine learning um, to it to report back to the app um, and the front end um, predictions of whether trains are busy or not. That's actually a very interesting and complex problem because trains can stop um, very frequently in metropolitan areas, they might stop every one or two minutes and are highly dynamic systems where people can get on and off all the time. Um, so modeling 
um, how busy trains are from very sparse crowdsourced data is an interesting problem. But we also do that um, in sub-second latency from um, um, receiving the feedback on the platform to engineering the data, scoring it and provide updates to the front end. And we started um, developing this um, um, mod, um, this crowd alert model and the pipeline and all the product um, at the beginning of the pandemic. And it took us three weeks to go to market with it, which is a great success story. Um, but it wasn't without its challenges. And um, even so, it was a great success. Doesn't mean it was easy. Um, I guess. The question is, why is deploying models so difficult? Um, you don't need to take my word for it that um, um, deploying models is still one of the most challenging parts of the data science pipeline. Um, when you look at surveys, around 75% of companies say that they struggle with production deployment of data science models. It doesn't mean they don't manage. It's just that. It causes a lot of more pain than than it should. Um, usually, it fails in the first attempt and requires multiple iterations, etc. Um, but seventy five percent of companies, when when you run this service, have struggled with the deployment of data science models. So, well, why is that? Um, I think the first kind of important puzzle piece to explaining that is to understand that data science is its own beast and it's not just like traditional software. Um, data science has a complex development cycle, um, which is heavily centered around um, data, usually in some form of a data lake and requires lengthy um, data preparation and um, data engineering, feature engineering um, in the development phase of your model before you start building your models and evaluate and be ready to deploy your model. But even in, in production, that model behaves very different to traditional software. Um, the world is not static, it's constantly changing. So you need to evaluate the drift of your model. You need to look at retraining your model and you have to constantly monitor um, the performance um, of your model in production. So it has a very complex production life cycle, which is very different to traditional software. Um, when we look at the two environments, development and production, and we're trying to now bring our model and our um, feature engineering into production, we realize that this is no easy task because data scientists tend to develop their models and their pipelines using notebooks and Python. And these notebooks, oh my God, <laughs> they can be messy. Um, cells can be executed out of order. Some cells might still reference code from another cell you have deleted. Um, and I mean, yeah, mo most of the time, this uh, only ever ran just barely once on, on a data scientist's laptop. Um, and it's extremely hard to reproduce and understand how that final model actually was produced with these, um, with these notebooks. And production is a very different environment. It's very um, well guarded, um, structured. The, um, the application layer usually runs with its own um, data stores, um, which it manages. Um, there's security involved in data, which might have been available in development in one place in your lake, suddenly lives in very different places um, behind very different um, application layers, etc. So it's it's two very different environments. Um, and the tooling and the languages are also um, very different. Um, data scientists develop um, these days mainly in Python um, against some kind of data lake. You see Spark being used, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn. And then when we look at production systems, they tend to um, use a Java or um, Stack or .NET, and data lives in SQL or Postgres databases. So it is two very, very different environments trying to productionize um, your data science with these great differences is, is a big challenge. And a lot of pain comes from 
the productionization basically entangling the kind of <laughs> um, two environments together and either the kind of restrictions of production limiting the development um, opportunities of data scientists or you're trying to suddenly bring Python and, and all the data science tools into that um, very well curated um, production environment. And that causes a lot of pain on both sides, the people who look after production or data scientists trying to build models. And the challenge is to basically undo that knot between the two and have these two environments without that the restrictions of one um, dictate the requirements of the other. And so, well, how do you do that? How do you deploy models um, trying to avoid that pitfall? Well, there's a million different solutions out there, but it's actually important to understand that there are only two fundamental high level concepts of how you deploy models. And um, it's best to start there and, and differentiate between the two. You can either embed models or you can deploy models on a model in, um, inference server. Um, the model inference server is much more popular as a solution. If you ask um, data scientists how they deploy their models, probably 95% tell you some kind of solution which involves this um, pattern. Um, what defines that pattern is that obviously um, somewhere there is some data being produced and um, that blue box um, defines your data processing infrastructure which um, ingests data, processes data, um, where um, all of that happens and your model is deployed on its own inference server, usually um, in the cloud, um, in um, some different product. And the way you integrate this uh, model with your data processing infrastructure is via a request response pattern, either via API calls or um, RPC calls. And that's the kind of high level pattern, why, why would you look at um, using a solution which um, works in that way? Well, it's generally much simpler to integrate anything by an API call. <laughs> and um, you also obviously have much more flexibility in the model development when you deploy your model completely independently of the rest of your um, processing, data processing infrastructure, because the two things are independent and um, are not the same thing. You can quite easily add additional things in the middle between them to help you with um, optional um, middle layers like um, integration challenges, etc. cetera. Um, you can add quite easily a load balancer there, API management layers, etc. All of that can just be um, dumped in the middle between the two without that it necessarily has to um, impact how you build um, or process your, um, build your models or process your data. Inference servers um, is also where a lot of the data science, unique data science challenges have been addressed. Um, most of them provide you with out of the box model management, versioning, you can A-B test um, 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 models quite easily on, on today's um, well-featured inference server um, stacks. And all of them have some form of model monitoring out of the box. So it ticks a lot of boxes. Um, the alternative is to um, embed your model. And that means you embed it directly into your data processing infrastructure. So you see that this model now lives in that same blue box it has been embedded. And um, the main difference is that when you now execute your model, you don't have a re request response pattern. You actually call a function and you get a return value because the model lives directly within your processing infrastructure. Um, why, why would you do that? Why, why might that be an attractive solution? Well, one thing is model performance. When faster is better for you, embedding a model and doing a um, function call is going to be faster and provides much lower latency than when you deploy um, a model um, on some cloud server and have to do API calls. Um, when you embed models into data processing infrastructure, you have the um, ability to 
um, go all the way to like local inference on on a device or offline because you don't rely on the server um, in the cloud. You can do it on the device or edge processing, etc. To be honest, these are really rare use cases. I mean, that's that's not very common, and it's not really the kind of killer argument. The killer argument is that you inherit a lot of data platform benefits by embedding your model into data processing infrastructure. Because the truth is that data processing infrastructure has been around since the creation of data. Um, it's very mature software, um, and it exists with commercial support and is usually developed by big mature companies with, um, with healthy revenue streams. Um, the other truth is that model inference servers um, are still very much cutting edge. And yes, you can get um, inference software, which is very well tailored to the very specific nature of data science. But um, you might not be able to get that with commercial support, or it, it might be still developed by a um, startup which doesn't have the robust financial backing, which means that your procurement process might um, raise that as a red flag, etc. So it is, it is not to underestimate um, how much um, benefits you get from just um, repurposing your data um, processing infrastructure. I put some examples there. For example, you can get the, um, the guarantees of um, exactly once um, with Kafka, um, which is much harder to achieve with an API call. Um, you get the benefit of um, out-of-the-box distributed execution when you use Spark as your target to embed your model. Um, and actually, another thing is that scaling and recovery um, is much easier when it's embedded into data processing infrastructure because you scale one thing. You don't need to scale up your data processing infrastructure because you have more data coming through it. And then you also need to independently scale out um, your inference server and make sure that they both um, are of compatible size, et cetera, um, all of that is much easier when it's all just one thing. But let's start with model inference servers and have a look um, a little bit on the options there. Um, it's where probably the market offers the most solutions. And you can go on the left-hand side from um, very low level, um, all DIY, like using Flask, and you basically write code to manage your entire API yourself and deploy that um, to um, the kind of solutions in the middle, like Onyx Runtime or TensorFlow Extended, which provides you with, um, with this kind of um, um, managed and curated runtime environments where you just need to bring along your model. Um, the rest is taken care of to basically end-to-end platforms, for example, like um, Kubeflow, um, and fully managed end-to-end -end platforms in, um, in the cloud. Almost every cloud provider has some solution there, whether it's SageMaker or Databricks or um, Azure Machine Learning, Data EQ. Um, the, the kind of vendor space is very, very big, and they, they have very um, competitive solutions out there. So there's always something which um, serves your needs um, if you go with that model inference server direction. But I actually want to talk a little bit more about how to embed models because that's something I learned to appreciate um, a lot in, in my later career. Um, when we look at embedding models, we, we need to differentiate um, between um, batch scoring as a requirement or whether we um, have a real-time scoring requirement. Um, embedding models um, for batch scoring. Batch scoring, the gold standard in that domain is Spark by a long shot um, for data science and data engineering. And um, it is extremely easy these days to embed, um, for example, Python models or any kind of Python code um, via uh, UDF into Spark and execute it, distribute it on a Spark cluster. Um, but most companies, probably like, I don't know, 99% out there run SQL Server in production. Um, 
and have somewhere some SQL server and good trusty SQL server can actually host um, Python and R models directly in database and um, well, the modern versions can. Um, so it's a great target to just deploy um, models and run them in database just within SQL Server using Python machine learning services or our machine learning services. Um, another option which exists is um, Redis and Redis AI has um, TensorFlow, PyTorch and Onyx backends. So you can also um, just host and run your models um, directly on Redis, which is another extremely popular data cache um, solution, which exists in a lot of production um, um, stacks. And for the real-time scoring um, requirement, um, Kafka is the gold standard there and is an extremely common um, and popular um, real-time data broker you can find in a lot of production systems. And the Emily project makes it extremely easy to embed um, um, data science payloads directly into Kafka streams and um, embed your models into that um, Kafka real-time data processing infrastructure. Um, so I just want to um, go into a little bit more detail on, on the kind of Spark um, 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 embedding use case and why that actually is a very common um, use case is that, well, there's much more to data science than just the, the model. <laughs> um, there's a lot of moving parts in data science projects and the, the actual model is quite easily the fewest lines of code. Um, the data pipelines which feed your model um, training are the kind of hidden technical depth in most data science projects. Um, you have to obviously process um, your historic raw data into features first before you can train models. And these pipelines have to be productionized um, as well as your model. And the gold standard for processing this data um, is Spark. So you do tend to have um, Spark data pipelines which need to be um, deployed into production. So that it's very non-negotiable. So then it makes a lot of sense to also look at embedding your Python model into that same Spark environment. And I think that makes it such a common appealing use case. Um, it also became extremely simple to do that. Um, for example, with um, MLflow, which is a great tool to create more reproducible and accountable data science projects using tracking, um, has the capability of defining projects which become reproducible. But most importantly, it supports model um, serialization formats, which allows you to um, um, serialize models and then redeploy them. Well, how easy did MLflow make it to load and embed a Python scikit-learn model into Spark. This here is a, is a quick example. As I say, this is like the end of the pipeline. There's code somewhere which trains these pipelines and saves them. But um, for, for the deployment process itself, it, it gets as simple as that. Um, loading Spark pipelines back into Spark is obviously straightforward and should be. Um, it's just um, MLflow Spark load model, and we reload our serialized um, Spark pipeline. But it's actually no different for our Python model. There is um, um, MLflow pipefunc.spark um, UDF, and this loads our Python model and wraps it for our convenience into a Spark um, UDF so we can execute it on Spark in a distributed way, which you can see down here in um, at the bottom where we take our model UDF and execute it with Spark in a distributed way um, on top of our um, um, data frames and we um, get our predictions there. So it is extremely powerful and easy to um, follow this pattern of embedding um, models into Spark. And behind the scenes, Spark has distributed right our data frame across a cluster of workers and has executed 
um, that model on in a distributed way. Um, it has distributed the model itself, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of magic happening there um, and we can um, score massive data sets in um, really reliably with our with our data science models in production using using spark i know this is extremely high level whistle stop tour but i um <laughs> i told you that i blog about these things so um shameless self promotion number 2 i guess um there is an entire detailed article about um, MLflow and how you can use MLflow to um, create these kind of pipelines, serialize them, and then um, reload them um, for production deployment. It also um, exists as a complete working example in, um, in my GitLab. So you can actually just also look at the code, run the code yourself, and um, play around with it. The other example I wanted to talk to you about today is the real-time um, um, requirement of the real-time scoring requirement in using Kafka, because that's actually my daily um, bread and butter. That's what I'm doing um, at Trainline um, all the time. Um, all our Trainline's entire data platform is real-time, is Kafka-powered. Um, all our data exists as um, as events on on Kafka um, clusters, and we embed almost anything what's possible to embed directly within to that Kafka ecosystem, um, and and that's because it's actually quite an engineering intensive task to load balance a model um, and. By embedding it into Kafka, we we make our model um, um, well. We we take advantage of the broker taking care of the data distribution, and um, we can scale our um, our um, models quite easily just with um, hand in hand with our data processing as the data volumes go up, and we need. Um, more capacity in our data processing um, platform, we also automatically scale our models in parallel with it to also then handle the higher um, load to score this data. And Kafka makes it quite easy to um, manage a distributed model um, because the broker um, knows where the data is and where the ne data needs to go. Um, we can just deploy um, copies of our models and they receive the data they need um, and we can basically guarantee co-location of data in the same models quite easily just using the um, Kafka streams um, um, functionalities and we can score our data in real time um, using um, streams of data and we do that with um, guarantees that, for example, we score each request exactly once and um, that we co-locate data um, which comes from different um, places and on different streams, um, all goes into the same model instance for the same, for example, cu um, customer. And it's all fault tolerant and um, handles recovery because Kafka is Build to be just that a uh, fault tolerant um, data um, platform. And in the development phase, we, we still use our trusty Spark. Our data volumes are big and we process it and we build our features with Spark and train our models with Spark um, using Spark ML. And then we just use um, MLflow again and a different type of flavor. This time we use the MLE um, bundle as a flavor, which removes the Spark context from, from our um, pipelines and models and allows us to deploy um, these models into Kafka streams and um, embed them in there. I wasn't sure about time, so I, I hope that this um, just gives some appetite um, on that. And if you want to learn more about it, um, shameless self-promotion number three. Um, 
go to my medium. Um, there's a there's an entire article on um, end to end example of how to embed um, a Spark ML model as a um, real time Kafka streaming application using MLeap. And you can also learn more about um, how we build out this pattern into our own kind of real time data. Um, product platform at Trainline, which we call Kronos, and how, how that works. Um, and yes, so with that, I am at the end of what I planned on talking about today. Um, but maybe we have some questions. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Like this. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Um, awesome talk. Yeah, really interesting. Um, was was really cool to hear, you know, just like at a high level, like the different engineering decisions you've had to make and, and kind of the pros and cons of why you do certain things certain ways. Um, reminder to everyone, you know, throw your questions in the chat. Um, it was great to see so many people introducing themselves, but no one's asked Jan a question yet. So <laughs> yeah, go and put one in there. Um, I'll ask him a few questions that I... I was really interested in whilst I was listening anyway. So um, yeah, the fir first one for me is, um, and this is more just like me being nosy, I guess it's less of an MLOps question, but you talked about those real time indicators. Um, and I, so I use Trainline. Um, I've, I've used those indicators and I was kind of wondered like, how do you manage that? As you said, like it's the train can, can get to a stop and just empty out. And then suddenly like, you know, 30 seconds later, the data's, you know, stale. Um, I think you also mentioned, right, that the data is really sparse because probably very few people actually report. Yeah. Um, but what kind of clever data science tricks are you mm -hmm. doing to try and make sure that you get accurate predictions on that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm afraid I can't tell you the details because it is obviously the secret source <laughs> of, of train line. Um, but just to give you like some indication of like, you know, what we also have to help with that. Well, yes, it is very sparse, but you know, there are obviously patterns which emerge, right? Trains run on time tables and um, there are obviously certain elements which make then, you know, reasoning about trains predictable because yeah, um, it's not that every day all the trains run in complete different ways. There's a very um, fixed timetable. I think the only, yeah, the only variable part which makes it maybe not seem like that is all the delays. But <laughs> besides right. of that, right, actually it's a it's a very predictable kind of environment, um, the train. But then also train line, because of its platform um, position, has an unique opportunity to see the supply and demand, right, of like basically the entire rail market in the UK and also in other European countries. Mm -hmm. We have this kind of big holistic view over all the searches which happen, all the tickets which get bored, etc. We have access to wide range of industry data and we can pull that all together in into like, yes, using sparse feedback in combination with like lots of prior knowledge to basically make um, intelligent um, predictions. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, I hadn't thought that obviously you have um, you have tons of like data in terms of, you know, like searches and tickets as well. So even if people aren't using the feedback mechanism, you, yeah. you could probably accurately predict it anyway. Um, cool. Let's go to some of the questions in the chat now. People are starting to, to spill in. I think I can show them on here as well. Look, look at that. How <laughs> fancy. Um, so yeah, um, Limarcia, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong has asked, um, thank you for the presentation. Love the way you split into server and embedded. You mentioned at the beginning that 75% of companies struggle with data. Uh, do you remember where did you find it? I guess that stat, yeah, where did it come from? Oh, yeah, I mean, in some of my blog posts, I have a source for it. Um, I mean, there are there are a lot of these kind of surveys being done by, by all kinds of um, players in the data um, field. And I think I should like to say, around 75%. I mean, it fluctuates a lot and it really depends on which type of industry you ask. Um, 
I don't think that, yeah, the high tech companies who basically build their entire business model around data struggle that much <laughs> with, with um, operational um, operationalizing their data science. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's more like indicative. So don't see it as a, as a rock solid stat, I guess. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I'd probably assumed as much anyway. I've seen enough MLOps presentations where people throw in, you know, somewhere yeah. between 70 and 90% of models don't make it to production. So I mean, um, that's, that's certainly wrong because, I mean, most of these companies find a way. It's just that most of these companies struggle in, in doing it and um, doing it productively. Um, I think that's the right way to look at it. <laughs> great. Um, okay, so... Yeah, Francesco says, um, you've mentioned a few times scoring exactly once. Why is that important? Uh, wouldn't the scoring be deterministic? So, I mean, it really depends on the nature of your business. But what scoring exactly once means is that when you have a data point and you want to have a score, right? And um, if you do an API call to to an independent system, et cetera. That system doesn't know whether this is a new data point or it's basically it failed the first time or it tries again, or there's some kind of, you know, um, recovery happening and it just plays back the last five minutes. I mean, there's a lot of things which might duplicate data or requests. And um, Kafka is a system which as one of its strengths can guarantee exactly once if you, if you need that. And in certain use cases and industries, that was um, more important than when we look at train use cases. But yeah, I, I worked in gambling before, for example, where there, there's like a player safety aspect, et cetera. And you need to kind of guarantee that um, you have scored, considered and scored certain data points which have a player um, safety aspect, etc. So there are certain industries which have a higher focus on guaranteeing exactly one's um, scoring. If you trigger, I don't know, like a big um, reward voucher to your customer, right, then you might want to make sure that you don't issue it twice. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it, it depends. If you if you have a use case which requires it, you will know it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I think that's that's a, a very good way of putting it. Um, cool. So, yeah, next one. Um, what is the worst part about working with Kafka streams and ML? Ah, that not every other data scientist is using Scala as their preferred programming language. <laughs> cool. um, to be honest, I I, I mean it. It's what I do, so for me, you know, I I like it. It's 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 good fun. The challenges are fun and keep the day to day interesting. But reasoning about data in streams is very different to you know having data after the fact in like a lake or a SQL database where you can just join things and aggregate things. You know, after the fact, when you start to work in streams, you need to think about joining streams across time and everything needs to be windowed and these windows need to make sense for your use case. And it's like, it's, it's a very different way to think about data when it's basically all in flow. <laughs> um, and it comes with its own mind twisting kind of edge cases and challenges, but yeah, keeps, keeps the day to day interesting. <laughs> so it's not the worst part. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Oscar has asked about edge devices. So yeah, there's a huge hype recently about edge devices. Is there anything you compute on the train itself? Uh, and I guess I'm going to extend that and say, you know, on the on on mobile because yeah. you have a mobile app, right? Not at the moment, but I, as a kind of personal opinion, I think it will become more widespread because of e-privacy. Um, um, constraints and um, yeah, how we as, as a data industry have to come to terms with how we're actually allowed to process um, personal data um, and the kind of mechanisms which need to exist for, for refusing that type of processing of data, even when it comes to legitimate interest, um, your customers have a right to um, refuse it. Um, you might have the right to 
collected prior to consent, but they can still refuse the usage of their data in that way. And that brings up a lot of interesting challenges and obviously um, processing data in the control of the individual seems like a very easy solution to it. So I think that probably that will become um, not just a hype, but probably something we start to see more often also as a solution going forward. But whether that is like, I don't know, next year or the next 10 years, uh, who knows? <laughs> yeah. We've we've got to find something to do with these uh, like ever more powerful processes that go into phones anyway. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not like, you know, browsing your, your Instagram requires any more resources now than it did five or 10 years ago. So More complex filters. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe. Um, cool. Uh, Zhao says, Zhao? I don't know. I, I think I've, um, doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> um, cool presentation. I took some notes. Um, were these pipelines developed internally as the tools matured? Did the app mature with the internal infrastructure too? I guess it's, yeah, it's kind of which, is it the horse leading the cart or the other way around? Yeah. And that kind of predates me a train line. I, I was in the luxury position to join two years ago and the entire data infrastructure was already Kafka at that point. Um, but obviously that, that wasn't always the case. And, um, that's also no easy kind of architectural change to design everything like as a microservice architecture, which, um, puts all its data right on to Kafka so that um, other services can easily um, tap into data they need without that the producer, the data producer needs to know about it or integrate with the downstream use cases. It's, it's extremely powerful, but it's not how we used to design um, platforms and, and um, applications, you know, from, from day one. So, there was a, certainly an interesting replatforming um, at some point. Thankfully, I wasn't involved because, yeah, <laughs> I can only can only imagine the pain. <laughs> yeah, um, and then I, I need to stop trying to pronounce names on here. So I'm going to go. Mate uh, has has asked. Thank you for your awesome talk. Um, is there any trade off in terms of how limited are you in the modeling approach? E.g., when your model is of flavor of a flavor not supported by ml flow did you encounter that i don't know if i've asked that correctly but maybe maybe it's made sense to you yeah i mean like like for example like a few years ago you still saw many more data scientists working with r for example right and and what i've seen is that because of the tooling and and the kind of decisions the developers of of the tooling make and it becomes easier to use these tools and the decisions they have made right you start to see less r in the data science space and um and i think that is a consequence of that right so yes if you were to have um like data science pipelines and models in r ml flow is not going to help you <laughs> and and that would be extremely limiting then and it would be very hard to get an r model into for example, embedded into um, um, Kafka, which is a Scala environment or a Java um, JVM kind of environment, etc. But you see that you can still put it into SQL Server. So you might find other solutions, etc. And my presentation certainly was heavily opinionated. <laughs> um, so yeah, but there are obviously trade-offs, but there is also benefits to just follow what the kind of overall um, industry does and the directions it goes. Yeah. Uh, okay, we are uh, running out of time. So only one final question um, from Harsha here it says, uh, nice presentation. Um, so yeah, that's really cool that people are, are giving you compliments before they ask a question. So keep, keep that up community, we love it. Um, yeah, how would you go about working out cost of running an experiment versus cost of running it in production? Um, or ways to measure cost in relation to model effectiveness slash iterations? Mm. I mean, I, I guess data science is always experimentation and production. <laughs> um, the, the reason being that, you know, your historic data is never a guarantee for predictability of the future. I mean, we just went through like 
a pandemic, who saw that coming, who had any data points in their data lake to predict what to do about that, right? So, I mean, I think that actually what you see about like companies and teams who are very productive, they actually solve data science by bringing down the cost of experimentation and um, bringing a model into production is not like a one run of that kind of development pipeline, but they actually look at how they can just repeat that run over and over again, how, you know, retraining a model is basically like an A-B test because there's no guarantee that retraining a model on newer data now predicts the future better than the model, which has proven itself, you know, in production for a while and managed to predict and have predictability, right? There's no guarantee that that new retrained model is any better. You should probably treat it like an, almost like an A-B test and see whether retraining that model did any harm or actually improved it. So, yeah. um, so the, the cost of running in production is directly related to bringing down the cost of, of experimentation and just look at how you basically use MLOps and DevOps, right? To just automate these things, create standards around it. And yeah, an entire massive topic on its own. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we could we could talk for hours about that. Um, maybe. Maybe we should have a, a talk on that at some point. In, yeah, maybe shameless um, self-promotion number four. I have articles yeah. on my blog about that. <laughs> nice. Well, uh, yeah, well, I'll make sure that um, I send out the links to those blogs because um, yeah, for, for everyone's point of view, actually, the, the reason I found Yam was because I read one of his blogs. So I found it on Medium, was reading his one around about building the data platform. Uh, just reached out and said, hey, you know, do you want to come and talk to our community about it? And And here he is. So... Um, yeah, Jan, thank, thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, you know, people loved it. Um, and I will, uh, I, I will take you off screen now Thanks and we me. will, yeah, and we'll move on to Matt. So, um, oh, hang on, let me hide the question. Uh, yeah, just, just before we move on, um, a couple of things quickly. So, uh, our next meetup will be on the 22nd of March. Um, I've got the, that, that's definitely like locked in as a date. Um, so same time as usual, be like a, you know, Tuesday evening, 6 PM start. Um, I'm really hoping we'll be in person, you know, let's, let's all pray that there isn't another COVID outbreak and a different, um, variant and that we'll all be able to meet in person, but for everyone joining on the stream, particularly if you're not in the UK, um, it, the event will definitely be hybrid. So there'll be a stream, um, regardless, you'll still be able to watch the talks live, be able to ask questions and interact. Um, so yeah, that's. 22nd of March, um, you know, put it in your diaries now. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all there. Um, just a little thing for me is uh, before you all think that I have like a designer sofa and amazing artwork in my house, um, I'm in the office and I found this cool little corner and I thought it'd be fun to stream from. Um, I'm trying my best to make my own little meetup. So I have, I found a few beers in the fridge upstairs and uh, I thought just just to get you all into the mood of being in a meetup, even if you're stuck in your, your kitchen or your living room or whatever, I'm going to open a beer so you can hear the sound. There we go. The sound of a meetup. Right. And with that, I'm going to bring Matt on stage. So hi, Matt. How are you doing? Hi, Ed. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you you promised you'd share the beer with me, but I, I guess we're, we're too far apart for that. There we go. Take it. Lovely, lovely. lovely. Yes. Got it. Wonderful. <laughs> Um, so yeah, but thanks for joining us, Matt. Um, it's, it's really, I think I'm, you know, really excited to hear your talk. The it might ruffle a few feathers, I think, from what I what I hear. Um, you know, I, I don't want to steal any of Matt's thunder, but he's uh, spent the last few months tirelessly analyzing different open source offerings. Um, is going to give his take on which of them is good, which are bad, which he doesn't think are even open source in the first place, etc. Um, so. Matt, without further ado, I'll, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is a shame that we couldn't do the, the event down in London. I was looking forward to wearing this shirt in Shoreditch. I thought I might fit in quite well. Um, nevertheless, the, we're in the situation we're in, and hopefully next time I will be able to meet you all in person. I'm looking forward to, to coming down. So, all right. As Ed says, we've 
spent the last few months really deeply analyzing the space of open source tools for MLOps and understanding what works, what doesn't work, and really also, and this is where it gets a little bit controversial, what is and isn't open source. So I have roughly 20 minutes to convince you that open source tools are awesome, that open source is the way to go with MLOps, and also give you a taste of what we've started to form in Fuzzy Labs, which is our, um, what I call our opinionated stack of ideal MLOps tools that fit into a number of neat categories to solve particular use cases. Um, so we'll get into all of that over the next 20 or so minutes. Firstly, who are Fuzzy Labs? You may not have heard of us. We're a very small company up in Manchester. That's the second reason for the bees. Um, actually, I didn't think of that before I put this shirt on. It's a, I only realized it just before starting the talk, but it's a nice coincidence, right? We are an experienced team of data science specialists, and we're all passionate about the power of open source MLOps. We don't have a machine learning based solution ourselves. We don't you know, run a machine learning based product as such. We work with clients who have data science functions, clients who want themselves to use machine learning in an effective way in a production environment. And we help them to figure out what's the best way to do that from an infrastructure standpoint and from a tooling standpoint. And anybody, and this, this will be a familiar feeling to a lot of people in this audience, I think. When you first try to understand this MLOps thing, wasn't it overwhelming? Aren't there so many tools that do so many different things with so much overlap and complexity and marketing that it's really quite difficult to figure out what's what and how you should even get started? Broadly, we can break them down into our SaaS platforms, which are subscription based and not particularly flexible, locked into a particular vendor. Um, so, you know, there, there are solutions and we'll, we'll look at a couple of lows momentarily, but there are solutions where you essentially sign up for a service and you can train your model on their platform and deploy your model on their platform, which is very convenient, but it, as I say, lacks flexibility, leads to vendor lock-in. At the very other side of the spectrum, you have fully open source tools. These are things which are free to use and modify. They're as flexible as you need them to be. They inherently have no lock-in. And then the, the consequence, of course, is that you have to pick these things up, join them together, deploy them to an environment yourself. You're responsible for managing them. So that's the, um, the, the cost of that flexibility. But as I'm going to argue, um, and I'm very happy to, to then take the argument to the comments and onto LinkedIn afterwards if you really want to, to start the flame wars, the open source despite the fact that, yes, you don't get an easy turnkey solution, is the right approach for MLOps problems and for machine learning problems um, precisely because of this ultimate flexibility. Somewhere in the middle, you've got these partly open source solutions. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. This all started, as Ed says, when we began to put together this curated list of open source MLOps tools. You've all seen the awesome this, awesome that lists on GitHub. So we have awesome Python. There's an awesome MLOps list. I'm sure you've all seen that. Well, what we wanted to put together was the same kind of thing, but only open source tools. Um, so this um, we put out there sometime, probably October, I think, if I remember correctly. And then we put it out on LinkedIn. And for the first time ever in my usage of LinkedIn, the post went viral, which was shocking. I had hundreds of notifications on LinkedIn. Um, and I, you don't know what to do with that when you, when you see it. But it got seen by a huge audience. It got a lot of likes on LinkedIn. It got a lot of people. Generated a, a definite sense of passion in the community. People cared about this. People who were behind tools wanted to 
add their tool to the list. People who used certain things wanted to get them on the list. Um, so that was great to see, right? I mean, we we have made our bet on open source as a business and the fact that so many people were passionate about this and cared about this and really wanted to see this opposition to the SaaS platforms, which, um, you know, SaaS platforms have a lot of marketing behind them. But as I say, that lack of flexibility leads people to want to see something different, something that they can um, own themselves. And this is where I get to get really preachy about open source. Incidentally, if anybody can tell me where the photo on the right is from, email me and there's a prize of some kind. So here's the problem. Aside from academic textbook machine learning models, real world use cases of machine learning become so complex and so specific to the business that's using them that a turnkey solution quickly becomes too inflexible, too entrenched to serve all of the needs of that particular business. We saw that in the previous talk. We saw that you know the, the infrastructure used by the train line is a highly complex, highly specific, highly bespoke infrastructure for bespoke use cases. And so of course they have picked out their own tools. You know, we have we had Kafka, we had Spark, we had these sorts of things. So our point of view is that anybody who's doing machine learning in a in a very serious way in production is going to very quickly find that they need to pick and choose their own tooling and have a solution which they fully own ultimately we think this is the most agile way to do machine learning as well it allows us to react innovate collaborate without limits okay so that's the the preaching done with as I said earlier, this repo we put out there generated a lot of interest. Of course, we got a lot of people who had tools, people from, who represented vendors coming and saying, well, why don't you add this? Why don't you add that? So we had to start to think about, well, what does open source really mean for us? Um, so we came up with three criteria, which again, subjects for debate, discussion, flame wars. The first criterion is that it has to meet the definition on the open source initiative. So I don't need to go through that now. It's a little bit boring, a little bit you know, encroached in some legalese, but you can have a look at that definition yourself and see exactly what the open source initiative regards as open source software. And secondly, it follows from that that we need to have an open source license. Okay, fine. So Apache, GPL, BSD, these are all good. There's relative differences between those licenses, but we don't need to debate those here. Um, and then the final criterion was this batteries included idea. So a lot of the time we see tools which have an open source component. Maybe there's a client or a Python library where that part of it is open source, but to actually use the solution, you still have to have some kind of backend server, some sort of SaaS solution, um, or they're trying to upsell you into a SaaS solution. Whereas what we want, um, going back to these, these reasons why open source wins, is to provide a solution which is flexible enough and can be owned by the business. Um, so, you know, if you have something which is going to draw you towards a SaaS solution, then it doesn't really satisfy that criterion. Okay, so some examples. There's the, the, the controversy that um, Ed mentioned. I hope I don't disappoint when it comes to controversy, um, but I'm going to name some names and just say what our perspective on these options are. Um, and then we'll see see whether that turns out to be controversial or not. So firstly, weights and biases. Weights and biases is a um, experiment tracking solution and it's quite popular. It is a SaaS platform, but it includes open source components. So you have an open source client that you can use and then you pay for the SaaS solution for 
all of your visualization. So for us, it's a pretty simple case. Weights and biases should not be considered an open source tool. It's a wonderful tool, no problem with it, but it's definitely not an open source tool. Then ClearML, and this is where it gets a little bit more murky because you know ClearML, I, I have a great deal of respect for ClearML. I know that they have some fantastic memes and you know we all love that if um, definitely everybody follow Ariel on LinkedIn to, to see the MLOps memes. But with ClearML, the, even though the source code is available um, for both clients and servers and everything else, the server itself is using a license which is not an open source initiative supported license. And that's an important consideration. It's a server-side public license, um, but it's a derivative of a server-side public license. doesn't particularly matter what that is, but the open source initiative have a write-up about why they don't consider that to be open source. And then we have another case of um, Pachyderm. Pachyderm is a system for source control, uh, sorry, data, data version control. Source code's available, but again, the license is not a compat OSI compatible license. So we don't include that either. And then we have a few more nice examples. So Valahai, Valahai make no claim to be an open source solution. It's a SaaS product. So of course that's not gonna, you know, obviously not gonna make the cut. That's fine. That's not a not a problem for us or for Valahai. Um, Selden Core, our wonderful hosts. So Selden Core is a, a fully open source um, with a open, genuine open source license system for model uh, model serving. So that's on the list. And ZenML, which I'm going to mention in a little bit more detail later on. ZenML is a you know re very relatively recent project that provides machine learning pipelines. It's a fully open source system. It's a company which has recently received some investment and ultimately probably will end up building some kind of SaaS offering built on top of this open source tool. But the open source is not going away. It's, it's you know, irrevocably licensed as an open source tool. So that's great. And ZenML is, is then on the list. Wonderful. So that was the... Um, that was the definitions and the reasons for behind this talk, the reasons for, for building this list in the first place. And where it leads us to is this notion of an open source based stack. So there's a number of tools which from all of this research, we've identified that from our point of view are ideal tools to get started if you want an open source based stack for MLOps. You don't need all of these tools. It very much depends on use cases. Some people need data version control much more than they need, um, let's say, model monitoring. And it might be that you know, one thing is a priority before something else. I think part of what makes MLOps so overwhelming when you first come to the space and first try to understand the tooling is this feeling it gives you that oh, I need to understand everything. I need to have everything all at once. Whereas, you know, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think that we can pick and choose what's, what meets our priorities first and then work our way along this stack or you know, in whatever order we want, more or less. So the first one is DVC. This is a data version control system. DVC is pretty critical to a modern MLOps infrastructure. It is to data what Git is to source code. And that means that just as with source code, we need to solve a number of problems with it. We need to know how do I ensure that I, how do I track the history of the code? That one's a clear one. How do I reproduce the state of the code further back in the past? But also how do I distribute the code among the team? How do the team collaborate on source code. These are all problems that, that Git solves, as well as where is the central point of truth for source code. In a similar way, DVC solves this problem for data. So 
how do I distribute the data among the teams so that they can collaborate effectively? How do I track the historical state of that data so that I can go back several months and see exactly what contributed to a particular model at a particular point in time? Um, and how do I uh, distribute that data? How do I say what, what the central source of truth is for that data? Um, so, yeah, so that's DBC, which takes us to the next step on the stack, which is experiment tracking. Experiment tracking, um, I mean, the way I, when people who are not machine learning people ask, well, what is what is this experimentation thing? Why why is this even a thing? The analogy I tend to use is that, you know, with with software, we're writing code. We, we have a task to perform. We know what the task is, and we know what the instructions that the machine should have in order to achieve that task. So we just write code, compile code, and we're done. Whereas with machine learning and with data science, we're dealing with a situation where we know the target but we don't know the set of instructions that would tell the machine how to do the thing that we want it to do, how to perform the task. And that's why we use machine learning. If we did know the instructions, well, we wouldn't bother with this stuff because honestly, just writing the instructions is far simpler. So that being the case, um, that, that's why we have experiments, right? So we, we form a hypothesis about how we might achieve the task. We try it out reiterate every one of those experiments has a certain data input has certain code that it involves and certain parameters that go into it and it has certain metrics that tell us how successful that experiment was so we really and particularly as we scale a data science team it's really important to track all of these experiments to have a record of everything so that we can say okay you know two weeks ago matt ran this experiment and got this result and here's how he did it. Sacred is one of many experiment trackers out there. Sacred is um, one that we think is, at the moment, most mature. I would say that from what I've been able to ascertain, and I'm very interested to hear other people's views on this, from what I've been able to ascertain, open source experiment tracking is somewhat less mature than other areas of tooling. Out of the tools available, Sacred for us turns out to be a decent, robust system. Um, and it seems that actually Neptune seems to be built on, Neptune is a SaaS product for experiment tracking, but it seems to actually be built on top of, of um, Sacred. If you have a look at the, the Sacred repo, you'll see a, a reference to Neptune in there. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, Sacred is a system which comes out of the Swiss AI lab. It's a, it's a pretty decent solution, and it has um, a various user interfaces that you can plug into it, which is quite nice. Um, and then tying it all together. So ZenML, I mentioned earlier, ZenML is one of my favorite things right now. I get quite excited about it. ZenML is all about machine learning pipelines. So defining the steps needed to build a model as code and purely focusing on that. So actually executing the pipelines, actually training the models takes place either locally on your machine or in what they call an uh, orchestration environment. So it could be Kubeflow, it could be Apache Airflow. The philosophy behind ZenML is to have integrations into as many different systems as possible. So you write your pipelines, but then you can run those pipelines on all sorts of environments. Um, and you can integrate into deployment tools. So various open source deployment tools, which you'll see on the list. You can integrate those models into various monitoring solutions as well. Come to monitoring in a second. So yeah, I mean, ZenML is, and, and for me, I, I would say, in fact, that if you're getting started looking at MLOps infrastructure for a machine learning project, ZenML is definitely a good place to start because everything else kind of connects to it. So that's very useful. Moving 
one step further, we have serving and um, Ed didn't pay me to put this slide on, I promise. But Selden Core, we've said Selden Core, actually model serving is quite a mature region of open source MLOps tooling, which is nice to see. So Selden Core is one of several pretty mature, pretty high quality serving solutions. What's nice about Selden Core is that it sits on top of Kubernetes as do a couple of the other solutions. It's very easy to deploy to Kubernetes. I've tried it recently. Um, and one of the other nice things which I've highlighted here is that it exposes these metrics endpoints because the final thing we want in our open source MLOP stack is monitoring. It's the ability to monitor these models to detect drift, to detect bias, to detect potential problems later on once they are running in production. So, well, monitoring we can do with traditional software tools, with, uh, sorry, with tooling that belongs to traditional software stacks. Clearly Prometheus, Grafana, these kinds of things fit quite nicely there. But what we also know is that machine learning models have particular, particularly special metrics that would be interesting or would be useful for detecting things like drift. What evidently does is provides the computation layer so that we can um, generate the metrics that are relevant to a machine learning model. So they'll, and, and then it plugs into things like Prometheus as well, as well as a couple of other integrations. Um, so yeah, that is, so that's the entire stack now. Okay. There's one thing I've missed out and it's a very big thing that is how do we tie all of this stuff together? So I've, I've argued hopefully convincingly that open source tooling is the way to go. And I've mentioned what we mean by open source. I've shown you what we think are the best in breed right now to form an open source MLOP stack, but the tying them all together, that's really where the, the magic lies. And clearly this, this is not the, the place for a sales pitch. So all I'll say is, um, if you want to know more, get in touch and please do have a look at the repo. Please do contribute to it, uh, raise pull requests, disagree with me on, on LinkedIn or wherever you want. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's it though, please. Uh, any questions, please? Amazing. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Matt. Um, yeah, that was really, really cool. Uh, I was actually really surprised to see that you um, you had good things to say about Selden because I think um, I was expecting some you to find some reason that you decided it wasn't open source given how stringent you were being on. Uh, so I'm I'm really pleased to know that we get the stamp of approval. Um, yeah, just uh, to everyone else, uh, you know, throw questions in the chat like we did for Jan. Um, Matt's happy to answer all sorts of ones. In, in fact, he says the harder the better. Um, oh yes. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's um, worth saying as, as well, Ed, that you know we we don't want to be gatekeepers of open source. That's that's ridiculous. I think it's just you have to define, you have to have a definition somewhere, and and that's the line we we ended up choosing. Yeah. But yeah, um, so a couple of questions from me then, whilst whilst people throw their questions out there. Um, so the first was, I guess this is your stack for like a bare bones, like I can do more or less everything, right? Because there are a lot of, you know, smaller niche areas that you haven't covered. So like, you know, there's nothing in there on feature stores, or how you do that, or if I wanted to do open source explainability or interpretability of my model. Um, so there are lots and lots of different like edge cases. Um, do you see the stack evolving? Are you gonna add those kind of things when you get time to go through another thousand tools? Um, yeah, what's what's the plan? I definitely see the stack evolving, but I also think there's value in a starting with a minimal stack. Now, of course, it depends on on the needs of the client, and usually, what we do is we start by doing some assessment to figure out what's the what are the priorities for this particular project. But like my ideal world is to be able to say, okay, we have our baseline stack up and running and we can run our hello world model train it deploy it monitor it and that's like that's the baseline 
and then we can build on top of that as as the needs needs evolve cool yeah i think um that's it's definitely the right approach right you need to need to be able to get something into production and monitor it um before you look at all the other tooling around it um my my second question i wanted to ask before we go to others is um how do you deal with the risk of an open source tool or library that just ends up not being maintained anymore i mean so if you you know in the mlop space at the moment there are you know it's no secret there are tons and tons of tooling providers there are more and more entering the space every day um a lot of which are building stuff on open source or you know similar uh, you know pseudo open source things as you referenced earlier um not all of them are going to make it you know I, for one, hope that Selden will definitely be one of the big players in a few years' time, um, but probably not everyone in the serving space will. Um, yeah, how do you deal with that? You know, if you kind of put your eggs into the basket that then is no longer there, do you take the product on and own it yourself and maintain the code base? Yeah, I mean, this is a really, really interesting one. So just from the perspective of this curated list, that that's an easy one because... I would say, you know, we're not the only maintainers of the list. And if something has, if something that we're not actually using on client projects happens to be on the list and it becomes stagnant, then I would say, hopefully the community can flag that up and, and deal with it. So that's, that's great. But when it's something we are using, I think there's, there's two things to say there. Firstly, that we're not, we don't want to, just be consumers of open source tools as a business we want to be part of the community that builds and maintains these tools ultimately you know we we want to be contributors to those tools um, in whatever ways we can and so yes there is therefore potential scope that we could end up maintaining something although i don't i don't see a path where that happens right now i think the tools we've picked are extremely well-maintained popular and they have commercial backing and that's the second the second point which is everything we've picked pretty much everything we've put on that stack has some level of commercial backing so that we can you know, go to our clients and, and provide a little bit of confidence to say that this thing isn't going away it's not some fly-by-night um operation it's a genuine thing that has some you know vc funding that has a commercial operation behind it whatever it may be so even though it is an open source tool um it's not it's not just something that's going to disappear if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah for sure and uh i guess you know hopefully your awesome mlops open source repo becomes so big and so popular that by putting a, a tool on there it can't fail because the community gathers around it and adopts it and contributes to it anyway uh, so that that will be the dream right that would be great. Um, yeah. Cool. Let's uh, let's go to some questions then. So uh, Nick says, super interesting talk, Matt. Uh, what do you think of ML flow slash what made you decide against it? I don't know a huge amount about um, ML flow to begin with. So I can't give a qualified answer on that. I have played around with it a little bit. And offhand, I can't quite remember what the what the license is, but I'm pretty sure it is actually on the, on the list. However, it's just not on the, it's just not on the stack. So, okay. So, because ML flow falls into a couple of categories. One is the, the training side of it. Um, and so one place it could potentially fit is as, as a runtime environment for ZenML. But what I didn't put on the list was so much the training environments and instead opted to just put ZenML on there as a, here's a thing where you can define your pipelines and potentially run them anywhere. So that's a, that, that's really the, what underlies this, that, you know, there's, there's plenty of different training environments that you could choose from, but they're not really, um, not really strongly opinionated about them and more strongly opinionated about the value of, a good well-defined pipeline that you can potentially run anywhere. Yeah, I think as well. So um, MLflow, where we see it being used a lot is um, 
from a like model registry point of view. And so that might be something that's a bit, you know, probably a bit more of your edge case type thing, where at the moment, you know, it's, it's not necessarily required to build a minimal MLOps stack. But actually, as you start to scale and you have more than just, you know, your one Hello World model or a few of them, um, having a proper registry that versions all of your models um, is is something you, you need for that kind of traceability back from, you know, my serving infrastructure did this prediction. Actually, I want to be able to trace that lineage all the way back to the data that trained the model that served the prediction. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's probably one that will, I imagine, will end up in your stack eventually. Uh, assuming the license meets the the approved recommendations or whatever, yeah, ticks the boxes. Um, cool. Let's let's move on. So Zhao says, uh, "Thank you for the presentation. Cloud providers like Azure and GCP are naturally developing solutions to tackle all the MLOps pipeline." Uh, hang on. There's a second part to this question. Um, that can gravitate towards organizations using only providers do you think that's a threat to open source i don't think it's a threat to open source and the reason is that from the experience i've had at least with using google vertex which is google's ai platform um, formerly known as google's ai platform and from SageMaker, my feeling is that they both suffer from either a lack of having all the features you need or from a lack of flexibility. So I still think the same, that they almost fall into the same camp as these SaaS providers. Now, I kind of get why, you know, because there is an argument to say, well, because the cloud provider, everyone's using one of these cloud providers so they can simply offhand, offload all of their machine learning and ML ops to the platform. But in terms of MLOps capabilities on these platforms, I haven't seen a lot of maturity. Now, the other, other thing that I want to say, though, is we would not tell a client, oh, don't do your training in, say, SageMaker, or don't deploy your model on Microsoft's AI platform. You know, there's no reason that if it makes sense in a particular use case to to not make use of um, serverless infrastructure in that way. But the core tooling, every, all of the orchestration, all of the everything that defines that infrastructure and makes that infrastructure what it is, um, will still be based on open source. So yeah, there's a, maybe a little bit of a compromise there. Yeah, I think um, I'd agree on that. I'd say like from my perspective, if I if I was a you know solo data scientist or at a very small team at a s small to mid sized company, I'd probably want to use something like Vertex or you know one of the other cloud providers because it just makes having you know all your stacks in one place uh, and presumably you know if you don't have too many use cases, most of them fit that happy path that can be very easy. Um, if I had Jan's job at Trainline, dealing with, you know, the, the vast amounts of data he has, and you know, potentially hundreds of different ML use cases, I, I don't think I'd find it anywhere near flexible enough. And that's, you know, why he he runs his own infrastructure and his team do, um, and they make tooling choices, you know, for whatever fits their use case. Um, so I think there's a, yeah place there's a place for everything, um, and I think we'll probably see the the kind of end to end ML ops stuff in, improve and mature on cloud providers as well. Um, so yeah, the, you know, all of them will be around. Uh, let's go to another question then. So um, Oscar says, a lot of people say Golang is the next big thing for ML and everyone should migrate there. What's your opinion? Is it time to forgo Python? Big question this. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Big, big um, answer. <laughs> no, I, 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 well, okay. So, I mean, I mean, we do use Go. We have used Go for, for certain situations, but more for writing web services that might act as glue in in a larger piece of infrastructure. I think Python just seems to have so much inertia 
in terms of having machine learning libraries and data science libraries and tooling that I, I don't see. I certainly don't see it as go. Kotlin is interesting. We've actually got one of our team likes Kotlin as a data science environment and has even contributed to some of the um, some Kotlin data science libraries recently. So, yeah. Um, I'm throwing uh, Dorian's comment up there because he's he's timed that perfectly for when you've said you've mentioned Kotlin. So he says, Oh, I Kotlin. mentioned it because I saw Dorian just to be, Oh, sorry. Dorian oh. is in fact the, the person I speak of. Sorry. <laughs> oh, fine. All right. Well, there you go. Well, even better time then. There we go. Um, it's, it's I've actually had Jan, yeah. Jan pop up in the, in the host chat here saying, um, Scala. So big Scala fan from, from Jan. I, I um, used to be a Scala developer. Yeah. But yeah. I, I do think it's, um, it's a beast though. To, to run a Scala based model in production is requires quite a lot of machinations. I, th I think your point about the the adoption and the libraries already being there is the, is the biggest one. You know, it's not that Python is the best suited language; it's just that it already has all the tools. Um, I remember seeing a talk maybe three four years ago about um, Jupyter notebooks for JavaScript, and someone had built. I mean, they're presumably there. I can't remember the name of the project. Presumably it has has grown and people are still using it. But um, I remember thinking that's cool. You know, at the time I was doing lots of JavaScript. Um, I can do loads of machine learning in, in JavaScript and it's like a, a notebook and everything. Um, the problem was when it comes to actually like importing libraries into there, there's not much you can do with JavaScript. And, you know, more and more you're seeing stuff come along. But then for every one JavaScript machine learning library that gets built, another 10 or 15 get built in Python. So it's kind of hard to, to overtake the inertia that's already there. The one I've got my eye on, eye on though, is Julia. Yeah. So that, that could be a um, future, the future, but uh, it's, it's definitely not the present. The present is definitely very much still Python. Okay, so we're all agreed that the present is Python and the future is possibly Kotlin, possibly Go, possibly Scala and possibly Julia. I'd, I'd put Julia on that list, <laughs> but that's just my, just my take. Cool. Um, I think that's that's it for the questions. So um, what I will do, hang on, let me hide that. Um, just say you know a huge thanks uh, to you, Matt, for that you know, really interesting talk. Um, and you know, thank you, I guess, from from all of our perspectives on doing the hard and gritty work of analyzing tons and tons of tools to come up with ones that work well together. Um, so you know, we'll make sure we share that GitHub repo link um, and any other relevant material. Um, yeah, just to everyone else on, on here, um, a yeah, huge thanks for joining. Uh, it's been a, you know, really fun time, uh, albeit, you know, online only. So I'm still slipping away at my little beer on my own, uh, which is a little bit lonely. Uh, hopefully next time you'll all be able to join me, um, and in the auditorium and, and everyone else still online. Um, so yeah, huge, huge thanks again to Jan and to Matt, um, and, we will see you all next time, which is the 22nd of March. So again, put it in your calendars um, and I'll see you there. Great. Thank you.